Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. Arrested on charges of aggravated robbery in 2019. Now, not only is he back in the workforce, but he's enrolled in a NASA program. It's another night beat. The story of a San Antonio man and his road to redemption. Storm chances are on the rise. We're going to talk about them and how they could fall near some parade times in just a bit. And call it a fiesta comeback. Tonight, crowds pack Civic Park downtown for the revival of La Semana Alegre. It's been nearly 30 years since the concert happened during Fiesta. Yeah, the 19th Avery Everett, photojournalist Matthew Craig there as bands took the stage. It's a memory and it's part of our DNA. And this is now version two. You've been to La Semana Alegre before. Yes, many times before. One of my favorite ones also. And also eating a lot of the food that they had. And of course the beer drinking. When you heard that it was coming back this year, what was your initial reaction? Oh my God, we couldn't wait to come back. What was La Semana like back in the 80s and the 90s? It was a lot like Nyota. It was rowdy and the people were just having fun, dancing a lot. And the location for La Semana. Yeah, I'll stick around for Lonely Horse. It is just so beautiful. What does it feel like to be standing here right now? It's just unbelievable. The food, the music, and all the gatherings and the family, it's just wonderful. Fiesta's one big party in the city. It's gonna be perfect. It's gonna be one great fiesta. Viva Fiesta! <laughs> and if you miss the performances tonight, you don't have to worry. There's still a full day of band lineups for tomorrow, we have that list on KSAT.com. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. It is one of the biggest and most celebrated shows during all of Fiesta. Yeah, it's the Battle of Flowers Band Festival and did not disappoint tonight. Dozens of local high school marching bands performing for the fans underneath the bright lights of Alamo Stadium. And it's obvious those kids put in a lot of hours at practice to perfect their marching shows. And it's really great to see them show it off right there on the field. By the way, happening tomorrow, you've got the Battle of Flowers Parade. And if you haven't received your tickets yet, haven't got them yet, you still have time. We've made it easy for you. All you have to do is scan the QR code on your screen to buy those tickets. Here's the best part. Your ticket includes assigned seating along the parade route, food and drinks. Hope to see you there. By the way, our coverage of the Battle of Flowers Parade begins tomorrow morning during GMSA at 9. Now, by the way, if you're going to be downtown during the Battle of Flowers Parade, you're going to have to deal with those road closures. RJ Marquez is going to help you get around them and also some detours during Fiesta. Just look for that article on KSAT.com. It has all the information you need. Have you seen this baby boy? Tonight, San Antonio police are releasing an Amber Alert for two-month-old Caleb Gomez. He's been missing now for two weeks. Officers believe he is in danger. Caleb last seen on Bree Sports Street near West Avenue in Nakoma. That's on the city's north side. Now, 42 year old Marissa Pena and 51 year old Eddie Gomez are suspected of abducting him. They were last seen driving a 2009 white Chevy Silverado with California license plate 8J47725. Again, 8J47725. If you know anything that could help police find them, Call police. Their number is 210-207-7660. The suspect in a case of road rage involving a school bus has died. According to Bear County Sheriff's 43-year-old Richard Mumford was speeding and weaving in and out of traffic yesterday on Highway 90 West. They tell us he hit three vehicles before he crashed into the back of the pre-K for SA bus. No children on that bus. Mumford was severely injured, taken to the hospital where he later died. Now, in two of the latest shootings here in San Antonio, would-be victims took action on their own. So we're going to start with the first shooting around 530 this morning. A homeowner told San Antonio police he shot two men who he says were stealing from him. He says they were taking roofing materials from outside his home on General Kruger. And a few hours after that, police say another man on Marbach Road shot a stranger who was trying to barge into his apartment. And they told that person, what are you doing? You don't live here. And that person says, no, I do. And they were trying to get in. To defend yourself and defend your, your place that you live in there, I don't see where it's wrong yet. So police are saying in situations like these, it's best to call 911 if you can. 
and they're still investigating the shooting at the apartment. But they say the case on General Kruger, in that case, the shooting appears to be justified. It is a program that's meant to curb assaults at the Central Library downtown, and it's soon going to be reevaluated. Last fall, the library's board of trustees greenlit that pilot program to have San Antonio police at the downtown campus part time. It's been in place for nearly six months and opponents have protested actually that police presence there. They say it intimidates communities who rely on the library as a resource. But one librarian assistant who was attacked by a patron says this program gives him a sense of security. I think a lot of people were saying, and I keep hearing it, that libraries are a safe place for minorities. Well, this minority got kicked in the face and I'm working to help the people that are saying it's a safe place for them. The library says it will work with UTSA to analyze how well that pilot program works and look at feedback from the community as well. So you know how they say that everybody deserves a second chance? Well, tonight you're going to see why that is so important. Back in 2019, we told you about a man named Jaime Lopez Jr. Mm -hmm. Police arrested him for aggravated robbery. Tonight he's in the news again, but now it's for something good. Something really good. Jamie um, or Jaime showed the night team's John Paul Barajas how his second chance helped him turn his life around and listen to this, join a NASA program. Doing different cooking jobs uh, throughout my career. And so this has been your go to spot ever since. Yeah, for sure. This is actually my main um, means of employment at the moment. Jaime Lopez Jr.'s story is so much more than him getting back on his feet and landing a job as a cook at Nola's Brunch and Beignets. That's just the beginning of his second chance. Once I was introduced into methamphetamine, it was all downhill from there. Lopez began struggling with substance abuse in 2016 when he was 22 years old. I had an episode of uh, drug induced psychosis. And from there, the sky was the limit. I was delusional. And then in January of 2019, police arrested Lopez for aggravated robbery. The gang unit task force pulled up on me. Um, I think it was the gang unit specifically because they handled dangerous individuals. And at that time, I was classified as a dangerous individual. He was in jail for 18 months. He tells us his time behind bars and rehab made him want to change. But missing the birth of his first child made him realize he had to. You went from being on SAPDs, be on the lookout for this guy, to look out, I want to do something with my life. Yes, sir. Yeah, I definitely did. But it wasn't through my... I had a lot of help. Now, not only is he working, he's also taking classes at St. Philip's College and getting a wide-ranging background in STEM. I currently hold a 3.6, so I'm, I'm on target to basically graduate with honors. His work landed him a spot in the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars Program, the one that's tasked him with organizing a trip to Mars for astronauts. Day one, immediately, I'm talking to NASA personnel. I'm doing events, I'm doing meetings, and they're very encouraging on, on everything that they say. They make you feel inspired. Lopez hopes to graduate from St. Phillips in 2025 and continue his education at UT Austin. His goal is to intern at NASA. Why was it so important for you to reach out to us knowing we had done stories about your troubled past. So a lot of people have troubled pasts and I feel that they become their own worst enemies in that sense because they will self doubt themselves before trying to achieve something great. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. I don't want that to get lost in this story. Jaime reached out to us. Yeah. He knew that we'd done stories on him in the past and his troubled past. He wanted to be an example. And he is. And I think it's, I just think it's incredible. 3.6 GPA. He's, he's planning to go to UT Austin. Um, he's put in all of this work. I have to say, Jaime, we're rooting for you. And we want to speak to you again, especially after you graduate from UT Austin. And the fact that you're doing yeah. this NASA program, you're on to do amazing things. That's what I'm going to say. Once you get that job with NASA, let us know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we want to talk to you. Yeah. Now, still ahead on the night beat, we have another inspiring story for you. A man with type 2 diabetes who defied the odds also has a message for all the people in Bear County with the same disease. And as we head to break, I want to share with you some of the sights and sounds from tonight's Battle of Flowers Band Festival. We'll be right back.
Tonight we continue the conversation about diabetes and how it's affecting so many people in our community. Diabetes is a major reason people lose their vision, limbs, or experience kidney failure. Now tonight you're going to meet that, that man right there from San Antonio. He's dealt with all three of those things, yet stand strong. When you meet Joel Gonzalez Jr., you can't help but like him. <laughs> the 46-year-old is a devoted husband and father of two. He's also kind with a great sense of humor. It's obvious his family loves him. What's not so obvious is everything he's been through. Joel's an amputee. He's also partially blind. 80% blind on my left eye and 50% on my right eye. Three years ago, Joel also had a kidney transplant after battling years of kidney failure. I thought I was going to die. All of Joel's challenges stemmed from one problem, diabetes. It could be because you're not making insulin. It could be because the insulin that you're making is inefficient. Diabetes causes a host of issues that can lead to kidney failure, adult onset blindness, lower limb amputations, heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, and nerve damage. So far, it's, we've been strong. Um, and we stuck together as one big family and uh, here I am today. And that's also because of his doctor, Kelly Hitchman, who literally gave him a kidney. Now she's using her experience to encourage other people to become living donors too. He is an absolute blessing and I think that's a part of it that people don't really think about. They think about the blessing for the recipient and hopefully it's absolutely a blessing for the recipient. But at least in my circumstance, I feel like it was a huge gift in my life too. What are you looking forward to now? Taking care of whatever I have left of my life mm -hmm. and trying to take care of my family. Joel also hopes the 16% of people in Bear County with type 2 diabetes learn from his experience and take better care of their health. We don't want to be in the position I am in. By the time you uh, think, oh, something's going on with my body, it's going to be too late. Yeah, he's been through a lot. Now, Joel is planning to take his family to Disney World, and I told him I personally want to see pictures of all of them with their Mickey hats. Now, by the way, you probably recognize Dr. Kelly Hitchman. She climbed Mount Kilimanjaro last month to raise awareness about organ donation. If you'd like to learn more about organ donation or get more information about diabetes, look for the story on our website, ksat.com. Talk about a patient doctor bond. Yes. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, although she didn't know that she was going to be donating her kidney to him. I Ooh. mean, they met each other yeah, afterwards, but, but it just, the fact that she was able to do that is amazing. Yeah, they're connected for life. That's true. Yeah. And we've got some rising storm chances in the days ahead. A particular timing is tomorrow morning, a little before Battle of Flowers parade time, and then again Sunday morning. But let's take a look at the storm chances as a whole. It's at 40% tomorrow morning. I think that's up through 9 to 10 a.m. And the parade doesn't start until shortly after 10 a.m. And then we have that 30% chance on Saturday, 60% chance Sunday morning. That's when we should have most of the activity. So here's the big picture. And we do have the West Texas dry line. It's kicking off a thunderstorm out west right now. But upper level energy as well centered over Denver with the energy swinging all the way down into Texas on the base of that trough. That's one element coming into play here, along with the West Texas dry line, some instability, and of course, some wind shear in the atmosphere as well. Here's one scenario of how this could all break down. 7 a.m. tomorrow off to the west. We have a little bit of activity starting to kick off. We're talking La Prior to Sabinal, then creeping up into parts of the hill country. Over the following couple of hours up through 9 a.m., we could have some quick thunderstorms moving through San Antonio and surrounding areas. So if you're headed out to the parade and you're getting there early, just have that quick brief escape plan where you can go inside or duck into a shelter very briefly or even just head to your car and you'll be okay. There is a chance that some of these storms could become strong to severe. Then notice by 1030 parade time, those storms should be out of here, but we'll still be dealing with the low ceilings and the drizzle action, just overall dampness out there. But either way, it looks like the storms will be out of here for parade time. That's a good thing. Enable the notifications with your weather authority app. We'll keep an eye on it, of course, very closely and keep you updated. Then we get into Saturday night and along the dry line, we could have this broken line of storms developing. We have plenty of instability around here. It's just a matter of do these storms survive as they head our way? And should they do that, which indications are they will, then they're likely to give us a round of uh, showers and storms early Sunday morning around sunrise. So battle flowers in the 70s. 
Notice parade kicks off around 1030 AM Vanguard at 955 drizzle. The showers moving out just damp for the parade. But hey, you won't get a sunburn, right? Contrary to many Battle of Flowers parades where the sunny side of the parade route, everybody scatters because it's too hot. We won't have that problem tomorrow. Flambeau in the 80s, humid, maybe a brief storm late after the parade, but more so into Sunday morning. Also, a bit breezy for Flambeau with that southeasterly wind pumping in the humidity. Notice the clouds today kept our temperature at bay. 84 are high this afternoon. 81 San Angelo up to 87 El Paso, 86 in Hondo, but we did make it to 90 in Catula and Laredo up to 93. Going forward, pretty uniform afternoon highs, low to mid 80s. That's all we're looking at because we'll have a lot of these clouds staying overhead. Humidity contributing to, to the morning drizzle and that morning dreary dampness outside. Dewey's right now, right near 70. So we're at that muggy to almost oppressive level and it's going to get into the oppressive levels next week. Dew points into the 70s. So very, very sticky out there next week, even stickier and muggier than it is right now. 71 at 7 a.m. Noon, we're at 78. Still a slight chance of a few storms tomorrow afternoon, 20% chance. But again, better odds up through 9, 10 a.m. Mid 80s tomorrow. But Floresville, 86, Divine, 87, Uvalde could get up to 91. And then we get into next week and we still have those 30% chances of storms every day. Isolated in nature, but it's that time of year where anything that pops up could become severe. Tomorrow's the day at the beginning of Battle of Flowers. Big shout out to the guys of the 149th. Out of Lackland, oh, I was texting with Mike Mike about uh, ceilings and what they need for the flyover tomorrow. And we'll be playing my video. Wang Chung right there. He's going to be uh, in the KSAT viewing area and he's going to be talking. Oh, baby. Nice. It's going to be good. <laughs> oh, we have live cam to look at, too. <laughs> it was a lot more fun looking down on the clouds, to be honest with you. We had layers of clouds to go through. <sighs> we were pulling five, five and a half G's. But if anybody asked, it was like nine. OK, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Because a lot of people will ask. If they do. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hello there. So we're on late, obviously, for a reason. Yeah. Draft. NFL draft. So the Cowboys started off with the 24th pick. They traded down to the 29th. I believe they got the guy they wanted. At the same time, they saved about a million dollars in salary. That's always huge. We'll tell you more about who the Cowboys picked up. And Malcolm Brown tossed out the first pitch at the Flying Chunkplas game tonight. Coming up. In the 2024 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Caleb Williams, quarterback, Southern California. No surprise there. The Bears have a new quarterback in Caleb Williams and Big Board Sports. All right, so the Dallas Cowboys started the day with the 24th pick in the first round tonight, but just before 10 p.m. local time, the Lions and Cowboys made a trade. Detroit moved up to 24 and received the 2025 seventh round pick, and in return, the boys dropped down to 29 and also picked up a second third round pick in this year's draft. And with the 29th overall selection, the boys selected offensive tackle Tyler Guyton from the Oklahoma Sooners, who's watching the draft in Austin tonight, and clearly he's happy. Offensive tackle is definitely one of the boys needs. Now that Tyron Smith is no longer with the team. Guyton started his collegiate career at TCU and then transferred to OU. He played both left and right tackle in 2022 for the Sooners. We'll have more on this draft pick tomorrow. So here's the top 10 for your quarterbacks. Go one, two, three. Williams to the Bears. Jaden Daniels to the Commanders. And Drake May to the Patriots. Wideout Marvin Harrison Jr. goes fourth overall to the Cardinals. And offensive tackle Joe Alt went next to the Chargers. Wide receiver Malik Neighbors is now a giant. OT, J.C. Latham goes seventh to the Titans. QB Michael Penix Jr. was drafted eighth by the Falcons. Wideout Rome Odunze, ninth to the Bears. And QB J.J. McCarthy rounds out the top ten to the Minnesota Vikings. The San Antonio missions are loaded with talent this season, and one of them is a left-handed pitcher who is currently the third prospect for the San Diego Padres. But Robbie Snelling was recruited to play college baseball and football for Arizona than LSU. Sports producer Daniel Villanueva and photog Mark Mendez
says were out at the wolf yesterday to get the no to star prospect better. So what can you see from him when he takes the mound tomorrow night? My arsenal is more fastball, curveball, uh, changeup. Um, trying to mix a slider in there here potentially, but um, really those those three are my are my main pitches. You played high school football and baseball. You were going to go to Arizona, then LSU. You decided to go with the Padres. How did you make that decision? It was really hard. Like dad was the football coach at my high school for 24 years my uncle uh, played in the NFL and also coaches college football and grandparents were football coaches like just really rooted deep in in football I thought that's what I was going to do you know growing up that was that was my dream but really baseball separated itself for me and it boiled down to I, I enjoyed playing it a lot more than I did football as you know the the high school years came to an end I already like hobbies like hunting and golfing have you been able to do any of that while you've been in Texas a um, lot of lot of golfing Mondays and then some mornings where you know you don't have to report until you know around three o'clock to the field you get to go in and play nine or 18 holes it's it's a great way to just kind of relax and get your mind off of baseball because you know when you're doing this for five to six months a year it's it, it can be a little bit tolling on the body what do you like about the pitching here at the, at the Wolf? it's very pitcher friendly the environment that you're in I, I, I love it it's it's been a one of my my top ballparks that I played in that I enjoyed. Good luck on Friday. Thanks, Larry. Back to you. Thanks, Robbie. All right, Steel Knight, Texas Longhorn, eight-year NFL running back Malcolm Brown was at the Flying Chocolates game tonight to throw out the ceremonial first pitch, and Brown delivered. Here it comes. Check it out. Right over the plate, outside for a strike, just catching it, and Malcolm absolutely loving it. Nice pitch, man. Let's check out the score. The wind surge win tonight, unfortunately, 9-2. to two. The six-game series continues tomorrow. And Randy Mahomes helping out Antonian football after the break.